All right, John chapter 4, starting in verse 1, we read, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, John, than John the Baptist, uh, verse 2, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away into Galilee. Uh, so a couple of questions come to mind right off the bat. Why wasn't Jesus baptizing people himself, first of all, and, and why did John feel that necessary to point that out to us? And uh, we're really not told why, uh, but some possible reasons, you know, maybe uh, possibly he didn't want people to, to have a point of contention. And, uh, and, you know, you could totally see this, you know, someone might say, oh, well, oh, Peter baptized you, huh? Well, you know, guess who baptized yours truly, you know? None other than Jesus Christ himself. You know, would you like to kiss my ring now kind of thing? And so, you know, how pe we will, uh, could build things up like that. And, and so maybe that's why uh, Jesus didn't baptize himself. Uh, maybe Jesus knew the line waiting to be baptized by him would have been a really long line. You know, while the other guys are standing there with a, with a short line. A few years ago, I was at the senior pastor's conference, and uh, at the close of the evening session, uh, Mike McIntosh, he asked if anybody wanted prayer for, you know, a fresh pouring of the Holy Spirit and uh, to come forward. And then he called several of the big-name pastors that, that everybody knows, Calvary Chapel guys, uh, to, to be up front praying, do, to doing the praying. And... Uh, and so I thought, hey, you know, I'm not going to pass up on that, right? What a great opportunity. Well, I wasn't the only one. Uh, everybody had that idea, right? So the lines are just packed. The aisles are full. And I'm standing there, and, I, and I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, you know, this is, we're going to be here all night. And so uh, I'm like halfway down the aisle still, long ways away. So I look to my side, and there's a pastor sitting uh, in the chair. I don't know who he was. And I thought, well, you know, he's a pastor. Uh, Maybe he'll pray. So I walked over and introduced myself and just asked him. Uh, I said, hey, that line's pretty long. You mind praying for me? And uh, he said, no, of course not. And so we prayed for each other. It was really, really good. And uh, anyway, maybe Jesus, he didn't want this, this blessing of baptizing to become a burden on just one person. And so he let the apostles do it, uh, the disciples, and then it just got passed down. Um, so the next thing we see uh, is Jesus splitting town here. He, he hits the road because the Pharisees heard about his ministry growing. And so why would that cause him to leave? Well, Jesus knew that the Pharisees would, would try to stop, put a stop to this ministry. And, uh, and it was not time yet. And so Jesus, he avoided this conflict for now. And, and he confronts them later on, and we know this, and he ends up being crucified. But now was not the time. And timing's a very interesting thing. Uh, for, for a God that is outside of time, you know, God is outside of time and space, uh, for him, he sure knows the value of good timing, doesn't he? Or perfect timing. And so uh, that's why it's so, so important that we remain sensitive to, to God's leading and God's timing in our lives. Like me, you've probably had times where the Lord has, has called you to do something and you don't wait long enough and you jump right in with both feet uh, but the timing wasn't right. You know, you moved too soon, and it, it didn't quite work out. You know, you see that later on. Or more often, uh, probably for me, uh, you've waited too long, you know, and now you're kind of out of this window of opportunity. It's over. You know, that person that he was leading you, leading you to talk to or whatever, they're gone, or maybe they've moved on, and, and uh, it's too late to do what he called you to do. And so you miss the chance. You miss the opportunity. Uh, and so we need to be sensitive to God's timing uh, as He's working through us in our lives and, and not only listening to what He's calling us to do, uh, but then, you know, watching, waiting for that opportunity and then acting upon it in God's timing. And, uh, and I, one thing I've noticed, and you've probably noticed this too, is God's timing isn't always the most convenient time for us. In fact, quite often it's an inconvenient time. Uh, but it's the right time, and so we need to be open to that, you know, listening to the Lord, watching, and then moving upon His Word. He continues in, chapter, in verse 4, and he says, And he had to pass through Samaria, so he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. 
It was about the sixth hour. So Jesus, he leaves Judea. Uh, his time was done there for now. And, and he knew that he'd be back, but at this time, God, God called him to go to Galilee. And uh, the direct route from Judea to Galilee went right through Samaria. But most Jews, they would go out of their way to travel around Samaria because they hated the Samaritans so much. And so we kind of need to understand the historical background. Remember, Jerusalem was the designated city of worship for the Israelites. It was there on Mount Moriah uh, that Abraham offered Isaac up to God. Uh, it was there, that same place, that David purchased the threshing floor from Ornan, the Jebusite, and he built an altar there. Uh, and then later, it was the same threshing floor where Solomon built the temple. And so it's clear that God intended Jerusalem, Mount Zion, to be that place of worship. Well, in, in 722 B.C., the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, and it was the pattern of the Assyrians to exile some of the people from the land they conquered uh, to other areas. They would spread them out all over the place uh, so that they'd be less likely to join together in a rebellion. Uh, so countless number of Israelites, they're forced from their homeland, and foreigners are brought in from Mesopotamia. And, of course, these foreigners had their own religions, their own gods, idols, whatever that they worshipped. Um, but they thought it was important to worship the God of the land, too. So they would they intermix their religious idolatry with the worship of God. And so the Assyrians, they would take uh, many people into captivity, and then they would send their people back, intermix them, and uh, they would marry. You know, the people would marry, and they, they would just become part of the, uh, the culture there. And normally, they would all then become Syrians. They'd be called Syrians. Uh, but in this case, they did not become known as Syrians. They became known as half-Jews, half-Syrians, or Samaritans. That's what they called them, Samaritans. Half-Jews, half-Syrians. Well, in the time of Zerubbabel, the Samaritans were not allowed to participate in the rebuilding of the temple because the Jews didn't consider them Jews because they were half-Jews. Uh, this may be what made them, uh, cause them to build their own temple on Mount Gerizim. Uh, they also had their own copy of the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of Moses, in which they've amended it to read Mount Gerizim was the place of worship, not Mount Zion, not Jerusalem. Well, things got worse between the Samaritans and the Jews in uh, 128 B.C. when uh, Shechem was captured and the temple on Mount Gerizim was burned by the Jewish leader John Hycanus. Uh, J. Carl Laney writes, By New Testament times, the Samaritans were regarded as apostate, unclean half-breeds. In traveling to Jerusalem from Galilee to attend a feast, Jews with religious scruples normally went through Perea to avoid the hostile and impure Samaritans. This was the background of Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman. So keep this in mind as we go forward, um, this, this uh, conflict between these two people groups. And so Jesus, he, remember he stops, he's resting at the well there, and it says in verse 7, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. So here we have the start of, of the second interview uh, by Jesus that's recorded in the book of John. And you remember what the first one was? It was with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And Nicodemus was that, the Jewish religious leader, the Pharisee. But now he's speaking to a Samaritan woman. And so let's, can, let's contrast these two interviews real quick so we can kind of see the range that Jesus has. Uh, last time, it was in Jerusalem at night. Uh, this time, it's in Samaria in the middle of the day. Uh, last time, it was a planned visit initiated by Nicodemus. Uh, this time, it's, it's a seemingly chance visit uh, initiated by Jesus. Nicodemus was a respected religious leader, uh, presumably moral, educated in the law of God. Uh, she was considered an unrespectable, immoral person and, and that was uneducated in the law of God. Nicodemus was uh, serious and he was polite. He called Jesus rabbi. Uh, the Samaritan woman, she seems to have this kind of flippant attitude, a, a response of hostility towards Jesus. 
So we see different locations, different times of day, different genders, different nationalities, different religious backgrounds, different education backgrounds, different moral statuses, and different attitudes and different initial responses. Uh, yet they had one major, one enormous, one huge thing in common. They both needed what Jesus had to offer. They both needed to be born again. They both needed to be saved from the sin of this world. So Jesus shows us that there's not a certain process, there's not a certain formula, there's not a certain procedure with this. You know, as people, we want formulas, we, we want procedures. Our, our physical bodies, uh, our, our flesh, our sinful nature, we love these things. And why is that? You know, why do we want to learn a process and a formula or a procedure? It's so we can do it on our own. You know, just show me how to do it, Lord, and then I'll take it from here on out. That's easy for us, isn't it? With formulas, with procedures, we don't have to follow the Spirit. We don't have to seek God. We don't have to be sensitive to the leading of God's Spirit. We don't have to be sensitive to God's timing. We don't have to be open to God just using us as the vessels we are. God speaking in us and through us for His glory, for His work, and, and for His will. Uh, this is very difficult for guys like me, especially. I, I'm a do-it-yourselfer kind of guy. You know, I want to do everything myself. Uh, I mean, everything that I think I'm capable of. I don't, I don't want to lead worship and play the guitar because that's so beyond my capability. But, but most things, I, I want to learn how to do, and then I want to do it. Uh, several years ago, we had termites in the house. And so I call the termite guy, and he comes out uh, to give me an estimate. And uh, so he looks around the house and he says, you know, we need to spray around the perimeter. We're on a slab. So he says, we need to spray around the perimeter. And then he says, we need to drill through the concrete in the garage in the back porch along the, the house where it joins the house slab and spray down in the, in the ground through the holes. And uh, so I ask him, well, how far, about, how far apart do you drill those holes? You know, and he says, whatever, like a foot, 12 inches or something. And then he gives me this estimate of $1,800 or some ridiculous amount, you know, and I'm thinking, am I going to spend two grand or do it myself? And, I mean, I drill holes for a living, not in concrete, but, hey, same kind of thing, right? So uh, that same termite company sells the chemicals to do it yourself. So I went down there, bought the stuff, did it myself. Uh, the point, my point being is I like doing things myself. And, you know, this, this, we're going through this church reorganization and, uh, uh that we're in process of right now, and it's, it's kind of difficult for me. It's designed to take a lot off of me, and it's a great plan, and I love it, but it's also hard for me to let go of the reins in certain areas. Uh, and uh, by the way, you guys were awesome last week. I watched online, and uh, it was just really cool. Uh, I was so relaxed about being gone uh, because of these more defined responsibilities and everybody just stepping up and and, and doing their, their ministry, and it, and it was a great service, and so a great job. But uh, So procedures and lists, they can be useful, uh, and they are very useful, you know, for getting things accomplished. Your, your employer has procedures that you have to follow, right? Your own house with your own family has procedures the family's supposed to follow. Some people don't allow shoes to be worn in their house or, uh, you know, Procedures concerning dirty dishes and laundry and yard work or et cetera, those kind of things. Uh, but here's the difference. Uh, the washing machine is a tool that we use to get the job done, right? But the washing machine doesn't act on its own. It doesn't decide if it's going to use hot or warm or cold water. Uh, it doesn't decide if it's going to run the heavy, regular, or gentle cycle. It doesn't decide if, if it's washing colors or whites. Um, well, maybe they do now, I don't know, with the, with the modern technology, but uh, the ones I'm familiar with, uh, the, the washing machine, it's a tool that you use, and it does what you direct it to do for that specific circumstance, that specific load of laundry. We, like a washing machine, are a tool in the hand of God. We are vessels prepared for use, we're told. Um, we don't decide the specifics. We do what God is directing us to do. Uh, well, because salvation is not a procedure. Uh, it's not a, salvation is not a procedure. It, it's not in a procedure. It's in a person. It's in Jesus Christ. And because of this, Jesus did not have procedures concerning this. He did things in different ways at different times with different people, 
following the leading and the direction of the Spirit. So we too, when it comes to being a vessel used by God, we need to follow the Spirit. We need to seek God. We need to be sensitive to God's leading uh, through the Spirit. We need to be sensitive to God's timing. We need to be open for God uh, just using us for, as the vessels we are. Uh, God speaking in us and through us. And it's all for His glory. It's His work and His will. Uh, just as Jesus does here, as we see in verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you then get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Notice she claims her father is Jacob. Jacob spent a lot of time in this area. Uh, he lived there. He dug that well. And so the Samaritans kind of elevate Jacob. They, they hold him up on a, on a pedestal. And uh, so her claim that Jacob was her father, this would have driven any other Jew uh, to road rage or something because uh, Jacob was the Jew's father, uh, not the disgraceful Samaritans that they considered them. But this didn't bother Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't really major on these minor issues. Uh, the point here, the big picture, was salvation. That's what Jesus is thinking about, eternal life, living water. He's not worried about backgrounds or genealogies or forefathers or a person's heritage. Uh, a, a person is not automatically one of God's people just because they are physically born in a country that observes God. You know, every one of us, no matter what background, what country, what race, what gender, every one of us needs to accept this free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ for ourselves. You know, we can argue all day long about who, what, and where we came from, but just like this Samaritan woman, we all need this same thing. And so in verse 13, it says, Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. He's referring to the well water. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. So again, Jesus, he takes uh, things from the physical and he points them to the spiritual. Uh, he does this so often. He, he, he takes these, the body's desire for water, this thirst that we have, this drive, uh, and he relates it spiritually. And uh, just like with Nicodemus, the words of Jesus kind of go right over her head here. Uh, she's thinking, you know, how convenient it will be to never have to come down to the well and, and draw water again. You know, like it's Willy Wonka's everlasting gobstopper kind of thing. You know, one glass of water and I'm hydrated for the rest of my life. Um, but what Jesus is telling her is that the things of this world will not satisfy her. She'll always be thirsty again for another glass of water. Only the things of God can satisfy us. Uh, the water Jesus gives us is flowing water. It's not well water. Uh, the living water does not run out. Uh, it keeps on coming. He says uh, springing up. It's a spring of water. Uh, it keeps on coming as long as we're willing to accept it. But the woman is not getting the point. She says uh, she'll take some if it'll keep her from having to come out to the well every day. Uh, she will take it if it will make her life easier. And so often people get the wrong idea about Christianity. They think their life is just going to be uh, easy, you know, a piece of cake if they surrender their life to Jesus. Uh, and and in, a, in a way, spiritually, you know, it is. We have peace and we have joy and we're resting in the Spirit. And so in, the, in a spiritual sense, it is a piece of cake. But, but physically, Christians often lead a, a life of physical hardship, physical difficulty, trials, tribulations. We're promised these things. Uh, and so we see this in the early church in Acts. You know, many were homeless, many were jobless, they were beaten and even killed for their faith. Uh, and, and it's still the same today in many countries around the world. So Jesus sees that she's not really getting the point here. You know, she's thinking of her physical needs uh, but he wants her to, to see her spiritual needs. And so he changes the subject on her right here. 
And uh, so th- think about this as he's, Jesus' goal is to, to share salvation with this woman. That's the intent of his conversation. And so he's, he's guiding her by what he's asking her. So he says in verse 16, he said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Uh, or maybe she said, I have no husband, you know, and batted her eyelashes. We don't know. Uh, and Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one who you, whom you now have is not your husband. This you have truly said, said truly. Uh, so Jesus changes the subject, and he asks her to call, you know, go get your husband and uh, come back. And, you know, she may have been sarcastic up to this point. Uh, with pridefulness about her uh, in her defense, you know, she's blinded by the enemy. Uh, she, and she had no idea what Jesus is talking about here, about this spiritual water. Uh, but for a person to appreciate what we are saved to, uh, we need to see what we're being saved from. So Jesus is bringing out her sin by telling her to go get her husband. She responds to Jesus m- maybe flirtatiously, you know, I have no husband. But Jesus says, you've had five husbands. And so again, we see the timing here. Jesus knew uh, she would be ready to deal with her sin. And, you know, we can present someone's sin to them, but only God can convict that person effectively. Uh, and so again, we need to be sensitive to God's timing uh, in these matters. And so now we see an immediate change in the attitude of the woman. Here in verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir... I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Verse 23, But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, for He is called Christ. When that one comes... He will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Notice that Jesus did not go to the religious people there in Samaria. He went to the one longing for a relationship. She was searching for that meaningful relationship that only God can give. But she was trying to fulfill that longing with one husband after another. And so she responds to the truth that Jesus said by calling him a prophet. She asked Jesus, where is the right place to worship God, basically? And, and, you know, that's that's like asking which church or which denomination is the right one. And Jesus says, it it doesn't matter as long as you're worshiping in spirit and truth. And so if is the truth uh, being taught there to her? the truth of God, the truth of God's word, the truth of God's provision of salvation through Jesus Christ? Uh, Is the Spirit being manifested? Or are we seeing the fruits of the Spirit in people's lives? Love, joy, peace, patience. Uh, That's what's important. Jesus is saying it's not in a where or it's not in a how, it's in a who. It's in Him. It's in Spirit, in Jesus. So Jesus brings this incredible truth to her. Uh, and that he is going to be the focus of worship, that Jesus will be the focus, not a mountain, not, not a temple. Uh, it will be about the Spirit, being born in the Spirit, living in the Spirit, worshiping in the Spirit. Uh, the Father is seeking those like this to worship him in spirit and in truth. God sees our hearts. So he knows if we're just going through the motions, the physical motions, God's interested in our hearts. He's not interested in a worship worship procedure, not a list we follow, not a task we complete. God seeks those that worship in spirit and in truth to be His worshipers. 
Verse 24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Verse 27, at this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he, that Jesus, had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. The disciples marveled at Jesus speaking with this woman. Uh, it's just because it was not the cultural norm for him to be speaking to a woman alone, especially a Samaritan woman. Uh, but the disciples were seeing the wisdom uh, in Jesus, you know, as they've been living with him and traveling with him. And so they're, they're starting to accept these things even when they didn't quite understand them. Jesus kind of did things out of the box a lot here, and so they're, they're starting to pick up on that. That's why they didn't really say anything. Uh, so the woman leaves her water pot, and she went, she went right out. Uh, you know, she went out to get the water, but she comes back with living water. She comes back with the words of Jesus, the word of God. You know, many of the apostles, they left their nets, they left their boats, their careers, their homes, their lives to follow Jesus. And we too are called to make sacrifices. Uh, we're called to give up some things in this life. Uh, called to leave our old lives behind. And uh, when we're born again, uh, when we, we start out uh, living this new life, many of those old things, they just don't fit the new life anymore. Uh, this woman, she knew nothing about Jesus. Yet she immediately started sharing her encounter with Jesus to others right away. You know, so often we feel like we have to be some kind of scholar, some kind of expert to share Jesus with people. Uh, you know, we share plenty of other things without being experts, right? You know, if you had the best meal of your life uh, at this restaurant and you want to go tell people about it, you don't tell them that the restaurant buys their food from this top-notch wholesale food supplier and they prepare their food on a three inch thick butcher block table that's daily treated with linseed oil and they cook on a commercial grade stove that's made out of type 301 half hard stainless steel or whatever right no you tell the people hey you went down to the barbecue kitchen there on virginia avenue and you had the best darn ribs of your life and plenty of them you know uh when you talk to someone about jesus just tell them what you know you know, if they have a question that you can't answer, tell them you'll get back with them. And then find out the answer, look it up, talk to me or one of the elders, and, and, and get back with them. You know, she said that Jesus had told her everything about her. And Jesus had really not told everything about her, but she could see that he knew everything uh, by what he said. We're told in verse 31, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples uh, were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Verse 35, do not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case they are saying, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Uh, Jesus says his appetite, his vitality is to be in the will of God. His strength was not in the physical. It was, not, it was in the spiritual. Again, as, as we start out in the spiritual life, born in the spirit, we need to feed the spirit spiritual food. And that spiritual food is the word of God and being obedient to it. Not just hearers of the word, right, but doers of the word, uh, doers of God's will. That's how we grow spiritually, learning God's Word and then applying it to our lives. 
learning God's Word and then living it out. It's both parts. And then Jesus, He gives the disciples an opportunity uh, to live out God's Word, to do God's will, to feed their spirit with spiritual food. And that opportunity still extends to us as disciples, as followers of Jesus today. The harvest time, it was April or May in that area. But the spiritual harvest was now, Jesus said. It was not time to fulfill their own appetites, their own desires, their own will. It was time, and it still is time, to do God's will. God's will is that none should perish, that all should come to repentance, we're told. Jesus said, lift up your eyes to the fields. They're white with harvest. Guys, we need to be out there reaping the harvest, sharing our experience with Jesus, like the Samaritan woman telling about our encounter with Jesus. You know, the big word we use for this is evangelism, and it's this big, scary word, right? But it's just telling people about Jesus. You know, it's a process that we're all working together in. People usually need to hear the Word of God several times. You know, we see this same place in Samaria. Uh, uh, It has a revival later on led by Philip, uh, the evangelist, in Acts chapter 8, in this same area. So Jesus, he starts a work here with the Samaritan woman and then with the men uh, that believe her. But then later on, uh, he allows Philip to take part in even greater work there, uh, a revival. We're told in verse 30, so there's a, it's, a, it's a, a process of working together, of doing our part as God sees fit, and then God uses another person to do another part of it. In verse 39, it says, From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. Just because of what she said, many, were told, believed in Jesus. She said, He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. So we see a spiritual harvest in Samaria. Many believed. And what did they believe? They believed in God's provision for their sin, that in God's way of salvation. They believed in Jesus Christ, that He was the Savior of the world. And their faith was started in the testimony of this woman. Just whatever, what she said started their faith. But then it was confirmed as they confronted Jesus for themselves. You know, God still uses our personal testimonies to get the faith started in people, in others. And then he confirms that faith as the people come to him, as they embrace him, as they start their own relationship with him. The Samaritan woman, she was so excited. You know, she left what she was doing. She didn't even bring her water pot back. She just left it and goes back. Uh, She was so excited about her experience with Jesus, immediately telling people about this experience. Do we have that same excitement about our experience with Jesus? You know, maybe we did when we first met Jesus. But that excitement, maybe it's cooled down over the years. Well, may the Lord... Renew an excitement in us today, in me and in you. An excitement in our hearts, even now, this very morning. That we would just want to run back to town, uh, like the Samaritan woman, and just tell others about our encounter with Jesus. Amen?